Good day, everyone. Welcome to another section of Cambridge International AS and A level exam. Today, I'll be going through um, Physics Paper 2, Variance 1, May June 2023. As you can see, um, these are the formula table. And the first question. Okay, interesting. The first question is we have to define power. We have to define power. And what is power? The simple question. So um, I'm going to write it out. Power is the rate. Is the rate of doing work the one mark question? So it's expected to just say one point, or you can write it mathematically. Power is work done over time. Taking. Time taking is measured in second. Work done is in joules. You can also define it like that. The next question is use the definition of power to show the SI base unit. We have to prove that the SI base unit of power is this kilogram meter square. S minus 3, X is minus 3. How do you do that? You can only show the SI base unit of power using the formula for power. SI base units are proved using the formula for the quantity involved. Since power is work done over time, so P is for power, and you know that work done is force times distance all over time. And you guys know that force is mass times acceleration. So look at the distance. So we can now start putting the fundamental unit. Mass is kilogram. Acceleration is meter per second square. Distance is meter over time second. So from here, power will be kilogram meter times meter as meter square s minus 2 divided by s so that will be kilogram meter square s minus 2 times s minus 1 at the end of the day power kilogram meter square S minus 3. That is what we are asked to show. Nice one. Let's move to the next one. Um, the intensity I of a sound wave moving through a gas is given by the formula or the model. And the meaning of each quantity is stated. F frequency, A amplitude, I intensity, V is velocity and k is constant. We are we are asked to find the SI base unit of k. Just first step, make k the subject of the formula. So that will be i over f square a square v. And what is the SI unit of um, frequency? Um, the SI unit for frequency is per second because one of our period A amplitude, the SI unit is meter V velocity, the SI unit is what? meter per second I, the intensity let's find the SI unit for intensity and uh, what is the formula for intensity power over area 
that's the formula for intensity. So the SI unit for intensity will now be what is power. We are asked to prove that earlier. Kilogram meter square S minus 3. And what is area meter square? So meter square cancel out meter square. So intensity is kilogram meter minus 3. Fine. So that's the SI unit for intensity. So let's put it in the model. And this is the SI unit for intensity. And K will be intensity is kilogram per meter cube. Frequency is per second. It has a power of 2. Amplitude is meter. It has a power of 2 on top of it. In the model, velocity is meter per second. So from here, we have kilogram per meter cube all over. Minus 1 times 2, we have minus 2. M square is that multiplied by N times x minus 1. So from here, so k will be kilogram per meter cube over s minus 2 times x minus 1. We have x minus 3 meter squared times meter. That's um, meter cube, if I'm not mistaken. That's meter cube. Um, okay. Okay, from here, so what do we have? We have um, intensity to be kilogram. Um, our intensity is kilogram. Oh. My mistake. Our intensity is kilogram per second cube. That's intensity. Kilogram x minus three. X minus three. So um let me clean this intensity this is x minus 3 so x minus 3 here cancel x minus 3 this is x minus 3 here This is x minus 3. So at the end of the day, we are left with kilogram over meter cube, which is the same thing as kilogram per meter cube. That's the SI base unit for, <coughs> for K, according to the question. Now, question number two is a question from moment. A rigid uniform beam weight W is connected to a fixed support by a inch, as shown below. Now, from the diagram, you can see a inch. Yeah? Um, okay, you can see an inch from the diagram. So the first question. Okay, do you know what I would do? Let's do a free. Okay. The first question is um, after reading really all the question. Okay, let me point it out. Um, this the total force, the compressed spring, as you can see, the spring exerts a force of 8.2 newton vertically upward. So this is a spring, yeah. It exerts a force. Eight 
8.2 newton 8.2 newton vertically upward on a horizontal beam of course it exact it on the upward you can see it upward on the beam a block of which 0.3 newton this is the block this is the block the weight of the block on the beam is 0.3 newton i can see the right end of the beam is connected to a ground this is the right end of the beam is connected to the ground that's the right end of the beam just want to point out for you guys that's the right end of the beam it's connected to the ground by a string so the the beam is held tight by a string on the ground as you can see at an angle of 30 degree to the horizontal so the tension in the rope um they use in tying the beam on the ground the tension or the force on the rope is 4.8 newton as you can see the distances along the beam is shown of course you've seen the distances from the beam to the five volt you see the distance from the from the weight the five, uh, to the inch you see the distance from the block to the inch you see the distance as you can see on the first in the question show that the vertical component of the tension first where the tension the tension is where the strain you can see the tension is where the strain um it says you show that the vertical component so which means that you have to look for the vertical component of the strain now let me sketch the diagram this is the ground we have a string from somewhere from the beam and we have horizontal component and this is the vertical component so this place is 4.8 and the angle to the horizontal is 30 degree so it look like this Four point eight last tension. This is thirty degree, and this is the vertical component. Vertical component VC. So the question asks us to look at the vertical component. That's sine thirty equal opposite over hypotenuse four point eight. So VC equal four point eight sine thirty. 4.8 times 30 and the vertical component sine 30 is half, half times 4.8 2.4 newton that is what we are asked to prove second question by taking moment about the inch determine the weight w now let me draw a free body diagram of the diagram okay let me use this side um this is the inch oh sorry i'm still on the radar this is i want to change the color so it will be easier for us to identify i'm drawing the free body diagram okay this is the inch Um, a beam rests on the inch. Don't mind my diagram. This is the inch. A beam rests on the inch. You know, we resolve the vertical component of this place. We resolve it to be 2.4 Newton. We have a block somewhere. From this point, we have a block according to the question the block exact a weight of 0.3 newton on the beam at a distance of 0.4 from the block to this place you can see the in the question this is 2.4 newton let me show you you can see from the block to this point 
this time it's 2.4 Newton. Now, we have a weight of W somewhere here. From the block to the weight, according to the constant, the distance is 0 0.2. Oh, in my mind, distance is measured in meter. 0.4 meter, 0.2 meter. And we have a string after the weight. And according to the question, the string is somewhere here. But the string exact, um, according to the question, a vertical force of 8.2 Newton on the beam. That's why the direction is upward. The exact um, the force of 8.2 Newton on the beam vertically upward, not downward, vertically upward, according to the question. Check it there 8.2 Newton vertically upward. And the distance from the 8.2 Newton force to this inch, we need to take note of those distance 0 0.5 meter. Now, the question asks. By taking the moment about the inch, find the weight of the U. Taking moment about the inch means that all the forces must go toward this place. Everything, the direction must, must resolve itself. Now, remember the principle of moment at equilibrium, summation of um, clockwise moment must equal to summation of anti clockwise, anti clockwise white moment clockwise moment equal to anti-clockwise moment what are the clockwise moment you want a direction of clock and everything must go toward the inch everything must go toward the inch so this is clockwise moment toward the inch if you are taking w toward the inch it's going in direction of clock clockwise is 0.3 newton is also clockwise toward the inch. 2.4 Newton is also clockwise toward the inch. So the clockwise moment, you know, what's the moment? First times perpendicular distance. If I take this 2.4 Newton, multiply by this perpendicular distance from the inch, perpendicular distance from the inch, you have to take the distance from this 2.4 to inch. 2.4 plus 0.2, um, that's 2.6. Oh, what's the distance between this weight and the string? It's some uh, 0 0.1. So if you calculate 2.4, so 0 0.2, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.3. So 2.4 plus 0 0.3, 2.7, 2 um, let's see it, okay, 0 0.3, 2.7 plus 0 0.5, that's 0 0.5, let's do the distance, oh, this is 0 0.4, skip this, this is not 2.4, is 0 0.4, sorry, 0 0.4, so this is 0 0.4 meter, this distance, sorry, now let's add it together, 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5, that's 1.2. So the distance from 2.4 to the inch is 1.2 plus take a force of 0 0.3 Newton towards the inch. The distance between 0 0.3 Newton and the inch, the distance is 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.8. The last clockwise moment, that's W toward the inch w is 0.1 plus 0.5 that's 0.6 so equal 
anticlockwise moment. The only anticlockwise moment is the force exerted by the string upward vertically toward the inch. It's anticlockwise. So 8.2 multiplied by 0 0.5. At the end of the day, when you multiply and add this, this, this. First, the first two, 2.4 times 1.2 plus 0 0.3 times um, 4.8 will give us 3.12 plus 0.6 W equal to 8.2 times 0 0.5, 4.1. So when you arrange, um, 0.6 W equal to 4.1 minus 3.12. So do your maths and find W, you're going to give us 1.63 Newton. That's the question. Any question? Okay, the next one. Calculate the horizontal component of the force exerted on the beam by the inch. The horizontal component of the force, horizontal component of the force exerted on the beam by the inch okay this is this is the inch exerted on the in on the beam by the inch this is the inch exerted on the beam horizontal component exerted on the beam by the inch this position is the same thing as this space horizontal component Um, on the beam by the inch in that if they're asking for this horizontal component this we know we have the vertical component by drawing this diagram this is 4.8 we got this to be 2.4 vertical component we are looking for horizontal component now hc this is 30 so we be adjacent to by hypotenuse plus 30 adjacent to by hypotenuse if i choose to use that so horizontal component is 4.8 multiplied by cos 30 okay bring your calculator out to do the stuff it's going to give us 4.16 that's the horizontal component. 4.16 Newton. The next question. The springs obey Hooke's law and has elastic potential energy of 0 0.32. Calculate. Now, what's the formula for elastic potential energy? So, um, we are looking for compression of the spring as X. And the springs will be hooked up. They are talking about the spring. On the question, remember that the spring exerts a force of 8.2 Newton upward. So we have the force on the spring. We are looking for the compression, X. And we have the energy store, energy potential energy store on the spring to be 0 0.32. This parameter, elastic potential energy, half Fx. Or half k square or half x square over k based on the parameter given. So the parameter given fit into the first one, half fx. Remember that e in the form of the first one is 0 0.32 equal to half f. f is 0.8.2. We are looking for the compression x. So 0 0.32. So equal to 4.1x. Make x the structure formula. That will be 0 0.32 divided by 4.1. That will give us 0 0.078. That will be the compression of the spring. The next one. Um, the spring is caught. The spring is caught. The spring is caught 
so that the spring extend upward. The string, oh, the string is cut, so the spring extend upward. This causes the beam to rotate, the beam to rotate and launch um, the block into the air. The block which is the maximum height and then fall back to the ground. Figure 2.2 shows the part of the block in air shortly before it hits the horizontal ground. So the block at height 0.09 meter above the ground when it passes through A. This is when the block is in air. The block has kinetic energy of 0.044 joules when it hits the ground at point B. This is when it's coming down. So the you can see the direction, look at the path from air back to the ground. See what happened actually. How many marks? Two marks. Now the question said, I'm going to use the question said, let me use this part. Let me use this part for question C. Let me use this part to draw some diagram. Question C. The question said the string is cut. The string is cut. According to the question, the string is cut, so the spring extends upward. Now, you know that in the question, we have a beam. Don't mind my rough sketch. We have a beam attached to the string. There's a string here attached to the ground. This is a string attached to the ground. Now the string, this is the string that held the beam, this beam family. This string of 4.8 Newton is used aside the inch that is there. So this string is used to tie the beam strongly on the ground. Now, and there's a spring, there's a spring somewhere here. According to this question now, this string of 4.8 Newton, they cut it off. So what do you think will happen when this string is cut off? This beam will rotate off. When this thing is cut off, the bring the according to the question, when the string is cut off, this string of 4.8 newton is no longer there. According to the question, the spring, this spring now extend upward. It's fly, it push this beam upward. It push this beam upward. As it pushes this beam upward, the block. But the block here, the block also fly up. This is the block. This is the block. It fly off. So this point, when the block is in air, is A. According to this graph. According to this graph, A is a point when the block is in air. When the block is in air, with the maximum height, with the maximum height of um, 0 0.090 0 meter. Now, according to the question, now according to the question, this causes the beam to rotate. And launch the block into the air. I've shown you the block which is the maximum height and then fall back. The maximum height reached by the block is point A. So the path taken when the block when the block is coming back from A back to the ground look parabolic in nature. That's what is shown. This is the path taken. This is from A back to the ground. You know, according to the question. The maximum height of the block from air to the ground 
is is four point is it zero point zero nine meter zero point zero nine meter that's the height of the block that fly off from the beam to the ground is shown here is zero point zero nine meter that's it now according to the question the block at height zero point zero nine meter above the ground when it passes through point A the block has its kinetic energy of 0 0.04 joules when it eats the ground. When it eats the ground, the block eats the ground with a kinetic energy of 0 0.044 joule. You know, that's at point B. Potential energy at point B, you know, is at the ground, the reference, reference point, 0 joule. Now, at point A, Let's look for the potential energy at point A. Now, potential energy at point A will be MGH at A. Now, what the mass? Mass of the block. You are not given mass. We are, we are given, you know, mass can be weight over gravity multiplied by G multiplied by HA. G cancel G. So, potential energy at at point A in this case WHA. W is 0 0.3 and H is 0 0.09. So what is potential energy at point A? Potential energy at point A will be 0 0.3 times 0 0.09. At point A, Potential energy at point A is 0 0.0, 0 0.027 joule. I don't know the kinetic energy at point A. I don't know it. Now, let's look at the question. Now, from the question, calculate the decrease in gravitational potential energy of the block for its movement from A to B. From A to B, it's coming from maximum height to point B. Now, okay, um, you know, at point A, it said, you know, from point A to point B, obviously the height is decreasing as it's coming from A to B. So potential energy is gradually decreasing and it finally becomes zero at point B. That was the reason why the question asks us decrease. At point A, Potential energy is 0 0.027. I've calculated it earlier. At point B, potential energy is what? Zero. So change in gravitational potential energy will be different between potential energy at A and B. So change in gravitational potential energy, according to the question, is 0 0.027 joule. That's it. Just put down 0 0.0027. Copy the answer. And the next one, use your answer in C and conservation of energy to determine the speed of block at point A. According to the principle of conservation of energy, principle of conservation of energy, the total energy at A, the total energy at A must be equal to total energy at B. A equal to, you know, principle of conservation of energy is that, that um, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It may be transformed from one type to another. So it's not destroyed, it's transformed to one form to another. Now, if you check my earlier sketch, point A comp comprises of two energy, kinetic and potential. Point B to the same thing, kinetic and potential. So the kinetic energy and potential energy at point A, according to the principle of conservation energy, must be the same thing as kinetic energy plus potential energy at point B. Kinetic energy at point A, I we don't know it. We don't know the kinetic energy. That's half mv square. Potential energy at A, 0 0.027. Kinetic energy at B, the question said 
is 0 0.04. Potential of, of B is 0. So at, at, after this point, we have half mv square 0 0.044 plus 0 is 0 0.044 minus 0 0.027. So half mv square, when you subtract 0 0.44 minus 0 0.027, let me use my calculator 0 0.044 minus 0 0.027. So we have 0 0.017. Multiply both sides by 2. We have mv square equal to 0 0.034. 0 0.034. We are looking for v. v is 0 0.034. Divide by mass. I remember that the mass of the block is the weight of the block, which is um, 0 0.3, divided by gravity, which is 9.81. At the end of the day, so when you do your math, v square should be equal to 0 0.034 divided by. We have 1.1118. 1 so V is square root of 1.1118. Then our V is 1.05. Now the speed at A coming to the question at point A. Now the next question by reference. So the force on the block. Explain why the horizontal component of the velocity of the block remains constant as it move from A to B. You know, he said as it move from A to B. As it move from A to B. You see it. Horizontal component is is not affected by gravity as it move from A to B. It's a vertical component that is changing. Um, so explain why the horizontal component and velocity remain constant as they move from A to B. The horizontal component is not affected by gravity as uh, as the as the block move from A to B. That's a simple truth and the answer. Um, The horizontal component, the horizontal component, the horizontal component is not affected by gravity doing downward motion. Downward motion. No, 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 let's put doing that motion. Let's put not affected by gravity. When is not affected by gravity? When the block move. A to B. That's a simple truth. There is no resultant force acting on the block in a horizontal component at the same time. And the next one the block passes through point A at time TA. Remember that point A, don't forget this is point A. Point A is here, and point B is here. This is point A. Point A is here. And remember that when um, when the body is moving or when a body is moving from up to down, when when the when the body moves from up to down, 
um, the velocity is increasing from A to B. Why is velocity increasing from A to B? The velocity is increasing because it's in direction of gravity. From A to B, velocity is increasing. So it's um, from A to B, velocity is increasing. So it's expected that velocity at B should be greater than velocity at A. We can prove that from kinetic energy. You know, at A, at B, let's see the kinetic energy at B. I think the question gave us kinetic energy at B to be 0 0.044. Why kinetic energy at A? I think we've calculated it before. Kinetic energy at A. Um, okay. Let's see kinetic energy at A. Kinetic energy at A, you know, is half mv square. So that will be half mass is weight over gravity. Why the speed is what we calculated at A, 1.05 square. Let's see it. Let's see what we have. This is speed, in case you've forgotten. 1.05, this speed at A. Just want to show you something. Um, 0.3 divided by 9.81 multiplied by 1.05 times 1.05 times 0.5. I calculated the kinetic energy at A. It was 0 0.017. You can see kinetic energy at A is less than that of B. So if I'm correct, the velocity at B should be greater than velocity at what A. So like I said, is increasing from A. From A, velocity is increasing. So which means and from the question at A is T A. At B is TV. So you're going, to, you're going to have a straight line like this. So this is velocity at A. And this, like this, is velocity at what? B. B is greater than A. So this should be the graph. Okay, let's move to question three. Um, question three look like momentum by force representation. A block is pulled in a straight line on a horizontal surface by varying force x. Look at the varying force x as shown. Air resistance is negligible assuming the frictional force. Oh, there's a frictional force on the block as a constant magnitude. See the frictional force? It's two newton. So you know, in physics, when you have two or more forces on an object, find the resultant force. In this case, resultant force here is x minus 2. That, that will be my resultant force. Take note of that. I might still need it. The variation of time t of the momentum of the block is shown. Of the block, as the momentum increases, as time increases, momentum increases at the point from the graph, at point 0.4 to 6. You can see that momentum is constant at a value of 6. So, um, question A, state Newton's second law of motion. Okay, quite simple. Um, the rate, the rate of change, the rate of change, the rate of change in, rate of change of linear momentum rate of change of linear momentum is directly proportional is directly proportional to the apply or it apply force that's the second law of motion. It's quite simple. 
Now question B. Use figure 3.2 to determine for the block at time t equal to 2, the magnitude of resultant force. Okay, this is your 3.2. At time t equal to 2, we check at time t equal to 2 and time t equal to 1 to time t equal to 4, the graph is linear. So the resultant force at time t equal to 2 and at time t equal to 3 and at time t equal to 4 and 1 from here to, from 0 to 4, they behave the same way. The force is the same. Why? Because it's a straight line graph. Now, but you have to find the resultant force. Now, according to Newton's second law of motion, what is resultant force? Remember, Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change in momentum, rate of change in momentum is that proportional to applied force. So applied force is um, change in momentum over time. So we have to use the graph to find the resultant force. You see the same thing as applied force, you have to use the graph. So which means change in momentum over time will give us the applied force at t equal to seconds, at t equal to two seconds. So which means that, you know, the graph is the graph of momentum against time. So the slope is force. But the question said at time t equal to 2. It's still the same thing when you consider from, from t equal to 0 to 4. Do you know why? Because it's a linear, it's a straight line graph. So they behave the same way between 0 to 4. So, um, you know, this vertical region is changing momentum. And this horizontal region is what changing time. So changing momentum over changing time will give us a five force of what they ask. You know, here is 6, change in momentum, here is 0, the change in momentum is 6, change in time from year to year, 4 minus 0 is 4. So, um, so resultant force, according to the question, change in momentum, 6 minus 0, over change in time, 4 minus 0, that gives us 1.5, give us 2. Sorry, 1.5 in time. That is all time force in the block. Now, the question I ask us to find the force x. Let's go back to what I said earlier. You can see from this, I said result time force on this block is x minus 2. Now, we have to find x. From the model earlier, result time force is x minus 2. Now, we have result time force to be 1.5. We are looking for x. So, x is... Um, 1.5 plus 2 that gives us 3.5 newton. That's it. Next one. On figure 3.3, sketch a graph to show the variation of force x. Force mm. mm. x with time t from 0 to 6. Let's go back. You know, remember that, um, so remember that resultant force. On my initial model, resultant force is x minus 2, equation 1. Also, remember that change in momentum over time gives me my resultant force. So from here, um, change. And also, remember that change in momentum is equal to ft. Yeah, it's equal to ft, resultant force. Multiply by time. So resultant force multiplied by time is equal to change in momentum. So, and from the model, resultant force is what x minus 2 multiplied by time. Momentum is mv minus mu, which is mv because the ball is, the block is pulled mv because it's coming from west. So u is zero. So I'm going to use this model. Now, this, now I want to find x. Um, when is when um, t is zero, x is zero. You know that. When t is zero, x is zero. You know that. No, no, no. Let's see. 
when t is zero, there's no x, of course. Um, between the question said between zero and six, um, I have to relate it because there's a momentum graph. There's a momentum graph here. Let me clean it so you can see it clearly. When t is zero, you can see our momentum is also zero. Momentum is zero. So when t is one, when t is one, momentum is one. Let's go back. When t is one, momentum is one. What is x? X minus two. When t is one, momentum is one. Um, at that point, x minus two. Let me check it. Um, nt is one. Um, oh, nt is one. Nt is one. Momentum is 1.5. When t is 1, momentum is 1.5. 1.5. So x is 3.5. When t is 2, that will be x minus 2 times 2. What's momentum? When t is 2. What's my momentum? Let's check it. When t is 2, um, when t is 2, momentum is 3. So x minus 2 is 3 over 2, 1.5. x is 3.5 also. So when t is 2, momentum is 3. When t is 3, when t is 3, momentum is somewhere here, is 4.2, 4.4, 4. 4. 4.6, 4.8, 4.2, 4.4. So when t is um, 3, when t is 3, right, I think momentum is 4.4 4.4 divided by 3 plus 2 3.5 at the end of the day x minus 2 equal to 4 over 3 x still gives 3.5 newton and when t is 4, let's check it. When t is 4, when t is 4, momentum is 6. When t is 4, momentum is 6. That's x minus 2 times 4 equal to 6. x is 2, 3.5. When t is zero, when t is zero, our x is 3.5 initially. So which means from between zero and four, between zero and four, x is constant to be 3.5. That's the meaning. Between zero and four, x is constant, is uniform with 3.5. Now after four, what's going on? After four, so when t is five, when t is five, momentum is also six. What is x? When t is five, momentum is six, as you can see. So x minus two bracket five equal to six. X minus two equal to one point two. 1.2 x will give us 
20 is 5. Momentum has decreased to 3.2. This is 3. 3.2. 26. I think momentum is also 6. If you check the graph. So x minus 2 bracket 6 equal to 6. x minus 2 equal to 1. x is 3. Decreases to three when it's six. When it's six, three. When t is five, this is five. So when it's six, we have three. Okay, let me stretch it properly. can see before from 0 to 4 is constant um, 20 is 5 is 3.2 is 3 oh sorry is 3.1 3.1 3.2 so 3.1 3.2 um this is 3.2 is 3.2 then 3 yeah this is the graph so it's a three marks question i think this will one mark um this will be one mark very sure this will be one mark this will be one mark this point the point at 5, 3.2, and the point at this should be one more mark. Or the shape is another one mark entirely, and this two point one mark, making three marks. Very fine. I'm very sure of that. I'm very sure you understand the question. Let's move to the next one. Oh, I'll trust. A baker in air contain a liquid. The base of the baker is in contact with the liquid and has area of A as shown in figure 4.1. As shown in figure 4.1, the liquid has density and fill the baker to a depth height. By using definition of pressure and density. To show that pressure is density, gravity, and height. Okay. Um, as you all know, pressure due to a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid divided by the area. Pressure due to fluid is equal to weight of the fluid divided by the area. Pressure due to the fluid is always weight of the fluid divided by area. So, um, so, so let's use this formula. I remember that volume is is generally area times height. So area is volume over height. And pressure pressure of the fluid. Which is weight of the field, mass times gravity. Area is volume over height. So from here, so from here, pressure will be mass times gravity over volume multiplied by height. So recall that mass over volume is density. So n. Pressure is density gravity multiplied by height. That's the proof. I believe it's clear. Yeah. Now suggest why the equation in A 
does not give total pressure on the base. Total pressure on the base of the breaker. Okay, I think uh, total pressure on the base. Okay, the simple reason is this: the pressure, the pressure at the bottom, the pressure at the bottom of the container. Pressure at the bottom of the container is due is due to the pressure is due to the pressure at the atmosphere is due to the pressure at the atmosphere which I usually call PA plus the pressure plus the pressure due to the weight of the fluid due to weight of the fluid which is HOG what we just put now. So, total pressure is usually pressure due to atmosphere plus pressure due to weight of the field, H O G. But you can suggest why the, equa the equation above, which is only this, the equation above is only, is, is only pressure due to weight of the field. Pressure due to atmosphere is not considered. Hence, it doesn't give the total pressure. In this case, since let me just conclude. So stop saying pressure due to atmosphere atmosphere is not considered. Is not considered. Hence, hence it doesn't. It doesn't give the total pressure in this case definitely that's it and the next question um figure 4.2 figure 4.2 shows the base okay from the graph the graph is a graph of pressure against x centimeter x is the depth that's height remember that the formula for pressure is h o g in this graph h is like x so x o g so they plot the graph of pressure against x that's p over x and it starts from the origin so p over x right pressure against x so pressure against x will give us this which means the slope of the graph should be density multiplied by gravity the slope of the graph so let's find the slope of the graph so for from the slope, we can now get density. So density can now be the slope of the graph divided by gravity. Let's find the slope. Um, or we can let's let me use it. Let me use let me use this. Um, let's see whether this will work. You know, pressure is plotted against the y axis is pressure, the x axis or the is height or depth. So let's use the equation of a straight line to illustrate. I think you understand it better and you help your paper file. You know, the formula is pressure H O G 
in this case our h is depth and is x in this case so y equal to mx plus t in this case y axis in this case is pressure x angles in this case is x that's the x why what is taking the position of m m is the slope what is taking that position is density times gravity there is nothing like plus something so which means the intercept is zero so i think this one should help so from here so from here i said the gradient from here the gradient is equal to uh, density times gravity so density will be the gradient or the slope divided by gravity so let's find the slope of the graph first now the slope of the graph the slope of the graph Slope of the graph can be P2 minus P1 over X2 minus X1. So, so the slope of the graph. So, so the slope of the graph P2 is um, the highest point of pressure. 9.66 the lowest point of pressure is 9.60 don't forget it's times 10 to the power 4 times 10 to the power 4 is there divided by x x2 the highest point of x is 8 lowest point is 0 remember that it's in centimeters i have to convert it to meter so i'll be 8 minus 0 Convert it to meter times 10 to the power minus 2. That's how I convert it to meter. So the slope will be um, the slope. If you use your calculator, okay, let me do it. Let's see if you make our work easier. 9.66, 9.66 minus 9.6. That should be 0 0.06. That should be 0 0.06 times 10 to the power 4 divided by 0 0.08. If you use your calc, it gives us 7,500. That's the slope. So I can now get the density. Remember that density is my gradient or my slope divided by gravity. So this, my slope is 7,500. My gravity is 9.81. So therefore density will give me seven um, seven six four point five two six which is approximately seven six five of my density. Now question D. A solid cylinder is held stationary. A solid cylinder is held stationary. A solid cylinder is held stationary by a wire. It's held stationary by a wire so that the base of the cylinder is level with the surface of the liquid as shown. So a solid cylinder is held stationary. Now since the cylinder is held stationary like this, stationary means that equilibrium. And equilibrium, remember, upward force. Upward force equal to downward force. The upward force in this case is tension. The downward force is weight of the cylinder. You know, the cylinder will exert a weight down. Since upward force here is tension, weight is downward force. So the weight of the object which is cylinder 
to be equal to tension. Tension is 0 0.53. That's the weight of cylinder. Now that's the first point. That's what they want you to deduce from here. But the cylinder has a length of 4 times 10 power minus 2 and cross sectional area of 3.7 times 10 power minus 4 meters squared. The tension in the wire is that. The cylinder is now lowered and then held stationary by the wire to the top of the cylinder. It's level with the surface of the liquid. Now, see what they did now. Okay. I think I have space. See what they did now. This is water. This is water. The cylinder is now lowered. According to this question, the cylinder is now lowered, such that, and held stationary by the wire. I still have the wire. Um, such that the top of the cylinder is the same level with the water. This is the meaning. The cylinder has been totally immersed in the liquid. So the, totally have been to the cylinder has been totally immersed in the liquid to experience of thrust. Up is the force exerted, um, the force exerted by the liquid on the object. That's up thrust. Remember, I see have the weight of the object downward, and tension is upward. So in the steam equilibrium, at equilibrium, upward forces equal to downward forces. In this case, in the first case there was no up thrust. Now there is up thrust. So the ten the tension will change. That's why the question asks for the new tension in the wire. Upward forces is tension plus up thrust. Down forces is what? Weight. So the new tension is weight minus up thrust. Now what is up thrust? Um, remember our formula for up thrust is density volume multiplied by gravity. That's the formula for up thrust. Density, volume, times gravity. That's the formula for our optus. So let's find uh, optus using that. So I think you are, you are given the formula for optus in the first page and check it. Um, okay, see it. Optus is there. Uh, what I'm using density volume times gravity. So from here, so let's find my up thrust. So in this case, my up thrust means up thrust is density. Remember my density, I calculated density earlier of the liquid 764.526. 764.526. Sorry, 764.526. Don't use the approximate value. So to get accurate answer, multiply by gravity, 9.81. Multiply by volume. Volume is area times length or height. Area times height, sorry. So up to us is 764.526 times 9.81, you are given area to be 3.7 times 10 to power minus 4, and you are given height to be 4 times 10 to power minus 2. So when you calculate this together, using my calculator, my up thrust is 0 0.111 Newton. So this is my up thrust, I can now calculate my tension. So the new tension because up thrust has been included, weight of the object does not change, which is 0 0.53. Up thrust is 0 0.111. So the new tension is 0 0.42 Newton. That's it. It decreases. Why does it decrease it? Because it has a support. Unlike the first one, it doesn't have a support. In the support is the water that supported the object and now lessen the burden of the tension. Question five. We have question five. 
six, seven, and eight. So we have five to eight questions. Let's take a break. And in a few hours, I will upload the second part of this section, which comprises of question five to eight. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. More and more interesting curriculum are still coming. I'm still working on them. Subscribe and share. Like. Thank you. In a few hours, I'm going to drop the many parts.